Hello and welcome to this week's Australian Stock Market Report. Now this week we're going to look at green hydrogen and whether now is the time to pay attention to this area. Then we'll get into the Australian stock market so I can share with you my thoughts on where it's heading along with answering questions and looking at stocks for you. I'm Dale Gillam, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within and we're Australia's most trusted stock market educators. Now before we move on, thank you for showing your support for our channel and hitting that subscribe button. Now remember, as you subscribe, click the bell on the right of it so you keep up to date with our latest video. Also give us a big thumbs up. Tune into our live Australian stock market show every Tuesday, 7 to 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Time now. This is the show where you get to ask us, the stock market education and trading experts, to look at your favorite stocks and answer all of your questions. Now over the last decade, the desire for electric vehicles has grown, so much so that rather than being a novelty, they are now becoming mainstream. Now as a consequence, Australia's rare earth miners have benefited with lithium being the big winner. This decade, rather than focusing on battery technology, there has been a big push towards renewable energy sources such as hydrogen, and it's shaping up to be the next big thing that investors should be looking at. The Australian Renewable Energy Agency, or RENA as it's known, reported that both the government and industry have undertaken a substantial amount of work in this area to quantify the opportunities in renewable hydrogen in Australia. As a result, they've set a goal for producers of hydrogen to be able to do so for under $2 a kilogram. Now, it was only two weeks ago, Australian company HiSATA announced that its new technology, developed by scientists at the University of Wollongong, could meet the government's target and that they can reach gigawatt-scale hydrogen production capacity by 2025. Now, according to ARENA, demand for hydrogen exports from Australia could be over 3 million tonnes each year by 2040, which could be worth up to $10 billion. Now, we've already seen Fortescue Metals partner with the Queensland government to build the world's largest green hydrogen manufacturing facility in Queensland. But they are not alone, as Wes Farmer's wholly owned subsidiary core gas is involved in a large project in the Latrobe Valley that would see them export liquefied hydrogen. AGL has also entered into this space and Origin Energy is also looking to enter. Right now I suspect we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg and that there will be more large companies enter into this space. With many smaller players also entering the hydrogen space in Australia, I suspect we may also see mergers or acquisitions of these smaller companies over the coming years. Now we've already seen one merger between Real Energy and Strata X Energy to create the Pure Hydrogen Corporation, with the stock rising over 20% in the last month. Now investors would be wise to study up on green hydrogen and be on the lookout for the great investment opportunities that will definitely become available in this space. Before we get into the markets, I wanted to say if you are listening to the audio of this YouTube recording via our Talking Wealth podcast on your favourite podcasting platform, and I know a lot of you do, then you can also thank the team here at Wealth Within for their effort in bringing this content to you each and every week. Remember to give us a five-star rating and write a nice review as this really does help us. Now we'll get into what were the best and worst performing sectors last week. Well, the best performing Sectors, they included materials, and that was up 3.65%. And that was followed by information technology, up 1.19%. And consumer staples, that was up 1.13%. The worst performing sectors, well, they included energy, and that was down 1.27%, followed by consumer discretionary. That was down 0.57%. And communication services, well, that was down 0.42%. The best performers in the S&P ASX Top 100 stocks included Allchem, and that was up 12.62%. That was followed by Mineral Resources, up 12.12%, and Fortescue Metals, that ended the week up 9.29%. The worst performing stocks included James Hardy, down 7.05%, followed by Harvey Norman, down 6.99%, and Reese, that was down 5.29%. So what do I expect in the market moving forward? Well, let's get into the charts for our S&P 500. All Ordinary's index update for this week will also answer your questions and look at the stocks that you've chosen for me. Well, we've just seen another bullish week on the Australian stock market, which is a great sign. However, a little bit of weakness happened towards the end of the week on Thursday and Friday, but let's get into the charts and I'll share with you what I think is gonna happen this week 
and where we're at and where we might be heading to over the next few months. So on the charts, as you see, normal charts there on the left is the monthly chart, on the right is the weekly chart. And I'll just briefly bring up the monthly chart just to sort of show you. You can see here, obviously, there is March. Beautiful, beautiful, strong month. We started off here in, in April, which is only a few days of the week, if you uh, will look at that in a few seconds. But you can see we really didn't go anywhere since the 30th of March. Last week was a bit of a, a nothing week, a sideways week, as you can call it. But as I said to you uh, last week, you know, we're up around the highest closes our market's ever seen. That's that point there is the highest close our market has had, which is six, sorry, 7823.3 points. So we haven't closed above that area yet, but we're getting very, very, very close. And I, I keep saying the close because you know, amateurs open the market, professionals close the market. And so that's one of the big, um, what I won't say, um, how do I say it? One of the things that are known about the market, professionals sit back and watch what the amateurs do, do quite often and then make their decisions. Often we see amateurs just jump in with bravado, um, hoping to grab a bargain or they um, into or exit on emotions, where the professionals sit back, wait to see what the momentum is and then jump in and then do what they need to do, whether that's push the market down or push it up. But currently we're sitting on a close of 7785 points roughly there. So looking pretty good. We're, we're getting pretty close to that all-time high in our market. If you look at, the, if we go through here, looking for the close last week, you can see there we're only a couple of percent away from a new all-time high. So it is really interesting to see our market being nice and bullish. And for all those naysayers, uh, you know, were saying that the market was crashing and, and really giving me a hard time about that, saying I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, the market's not crashing, did not crash and it's not going to crash. That low there back in January is the low that you know, we were looking for. It was in the price range. It was in the time range for the low that I was expecting. And now the market is really nice and bullish and the market doesn't do what it's done like this and, and be crashing at the moment. So you can see since that low up over 10.72%. One of the interesting things is looking at the highest close here, if we go and see here, um, the close last week to that previous close, which is right there, is 1.44%. Uh, that's an exciting thing. And last week we closed higher than it, pretty much almost every other one except that one there. So since this close here back in August, there's only been one other higher close than what we saw last week. That's exciting to me. Beautiful move up, nice move down really confirming that the bottom's in. What we just need to be wary of now is just a little bit of a downward move. Now, obviously, because we're near a new, new all-time high, we're getting towards our highest close that we've ever seen. You know, the market will sometimes sit around these resistance areas and just pull off a little bit. Now, if the market is bullish, the big end of town will push it through that all-time high and keep it going. That's what I'm thinking will happen. At the moment, we might see a few days down. Let's go down onto the daily chart and I'll show you what I was meaning about the market being a little bit weak. Let me just get rid of that um, there. So here we've got Thursday. You can see the market did push up to make a high of 7.839, but then closed down at 7.789. So closed lower than it actually opened. You can see the open there is 7.799. The close is 7.789, so 10 points lower. Friday, bit of indecision, dropped a little bit lower, but only really closed a tad lower than what it opened for the day. But you can see this big, beautiful run. And if I put my little tool on here, where is it? And it's not there. Let me put that one on here. So you can see from that, that bar there, right through to there, there were 16 days. Our market pretty much went straight up. That's all green bars, as you can see. Now, whilst in there, um, you can see there's a lower close there and there's a lower close there. It was a run up. Now we've got our first red bar. So I wouldn't be surprised if this week we see a couple of red bars earlier in the week just to slow the market down. And that's really what happens around, quite often happens around resistance levels, around all time highs, that sort of stuff. Sometimes they just blast through them, but you know, more often than not, you'll see a little bit of a slowing as the market is a little bit more hesitant to push it through. So I would expect that to only last a few days if we do get any couple of days down. But again, I wouldn't be surprised if the market just took off like a rocket and blasted through that all-time high that we got earlier in January of that 7.956 points. But let's go back to the weekly chart just to show you what I'm actually thinking. Now, I think once we get through this high, there's plenty of movement up on the All Orders Index. And I think 8,200 points to um, 8,400 points will be achieved 
achievable before we get our next peak um, on our market. Now, as you can see there, the market really does run in, in cycles and it moves up, comes goes down, moves up, comes down, moves up, comes down. And where the next movement here is still probably going to be sort of towards that third quarter of this year. So right now, I think our market is moving right up through to mid-year in a nice would nice nice move so there's nothing really to worry about one of the things i do need to mention is that the market is being driven by the top 20 top 50 stocks right now not the small ordinaries and if you look at let's go into the size um where are they the size indices now that's the sectors i want let me bring up the sectors here where is it give me two oh i can't yeah they're not here um no, nope, they're not here, so they're probably on my other one. But if you go and look at the sectors, you'll see here that the top 50, actually the size indices will show you what I'm talking about. here. Here's the yearly move on the size indices. And let me put it in order from highest to lowest. You can see the S&P ASX 20 is up 3.14%. Since 1 January, the top 50 up 2.3%. Top 50 there. Um, top two, uh, he's up 2.27 where you can look at the small ordinaries in the mid caps they're both down so this is what happens so the market these stop these top stocks drive the market so what you'll see if in the bull market is happening these stocks will actually move first when when the market is peaking uh, and starting to run out of puff you'll see these stocks generally more peaking where the the top 20 top 50 will be slowing right down and this is because the big end of town know what's going on but the the retail investors will still keep going for these cheaper end stocks if that makes sense um, rather than the big ones because they think the big ones are getting too expensive so they'll go for value on the smaller stocks but it's also inverse you know if, if the market is fallen you'll start to see the big stocks to take off bec up because they have dropped to a point where the big in the town want to start buying them again and they'll start moving where the where the small cap stocks will still um, keep falling away so you see that inverse correlation between those two this is a general statement um, and it's one that I watch quite regularly which and then looking at which sectors and which um, uh, indices in the market are moving and which ones aren't it'll tell us where that money is flowing on the big end of town so just be careful about what you're doing but right now i think the market is nice and bullish i think we'll break through that all-time high in the near future getting up to eight to uh, eight 1,200, 8,400 before the next peak. Could go a little bit higher, but right now it is looking good. But you also need to be a little bit more careful about what you're um, buying. And I think um, gone are the days where we could just buy and sort of buy and just go, okay, it's going to go up you know, and speculate there because the market is not the same. The pullbacks on the market are ferocious and they have been for the last few years. You know, we saw pretty much since the GFC, we all even before that, we saw moves down on the market. The GFC was quite swift. We saw the COVID low quite swift. Other moves can be really swift in the marketplace. And we are seeing that in some stocks, that with stocks getting punished pretty quickly. So it really is about you picking the right stocks because all too often people pick small cap stocks and everything else thinking they're going to get the best returns for them. And that's not necessarily the case. And whilst I've talked about about hydrogen in this report saying it's exciting don't fill your portfolio up with stocks like some of these really small new hydrogen stocks you know you might get a few winners but in the end of the day what's what ends up in your bank account is what counts and all too often we see people buy the, some of these small sort of stocks these startup stocks, these um, stocks that just list on the market, hoping to get big returns. And they see them move up quite well, but then they start to fall away and they don't sell them. And then they end up having a stock that's going nowhere um, or they lose on them. So it's really about the, the, the most important thing you need to understand in the market is how to sell and when to sell. And yet so few people concentrate on that. And I wonder why, but that's it for my market report for this week. Let's get into the stocks that uh, you have for me or the questions that you have for me. Now, the first question we have today is from, well, it's not really a question, but rather a statement from Philip who says, Hi, Dale, thanks for your thoughts and on holding stocks for dividends. Your common sense approach is very welcomed. In many ways, your Monday report has uncommon sense compared to many commentators. You cut through to give a simple, succinct appraisals of stocks for the average person who tune in each and every week. Um, thanks, Phil, for saying that. It's really nice that you do appreciate it. All too often, I get so many people telling me what I'm talking about is wrong or I'm not sure what I'm talking about. 
um, especially you know when the, when I was saying that the market wasn't crashing, you know I can't I can't believe how many of the comments I had to delete from people that are just sheer ignorance or just rude, just saying, you know that um, they they've completely lost faith in me or they I don't know what I'm doing etc like that. So it's really good that I am appreciated or what we are doing appreciated. Nothing in the market's 100. percent It generally is not, but again it's about being clear thinking and and placing common sense to it. And and you are right that a lot of what I say is not common out there, but it is common sense, if that makes sense, is all too often, you know, there are players in the market and commentators in the market um, uh, giving you information that suits their purposes, where Janine and I don't really care in terms of, we don't make money out of your trading, we don't recommend brokers, no, not even to our students, and all, all too often, um, a lot of times I'll have students saying, which brokers do you recommend for trading this or that or FX or CFDs or stocks or whatever else? And we don't give recommendations to our students because we want to remain uh, um, unbiased here. Does that mean we don't have brokers approaching us all the time? No, I get them all the time. I mean, even last week I got an, another new FX broker approaching us to send clients to them and brokers make money from transactions and so that's why we try and keep out of the transaction side of it and again that's why we do that on this video too is we try and remain impartial is the right word but giving you common sense and thank you very much for for your comments i really do appreciate it and thank you for your support for this channel along with the many other people that do send in emails of support such as yourself so thanks um, mate the next question we have is from peter who says thank you dale thoughts on ipl I've owned them for a while and are up around 70% since to be benefiting from fertilizer, etc. Supply, thanks to the Russian embargoes. Love to hear your view. So let's go and have a look at Inside Tech Pivot for Peter. So it is on your screen. On the left is the monthly chart. The, the right is the weekly chart as normal. And you can see there it has been beautiful rising up this stock, uh, Inside Tech Pivot. Um, and obviously here in March was a very, very big run up. So it's Look, look at this stock. This is not a buy and hold stock though. So right now, and if I put here, um, and I do like this stock, so I don't, uh, please don't assume I don't, but look at that right here. It's fairly heavy resistance right across there at that $4 mark. Now I'm not saying it's not going to go through that, mate. All I'm saying at the moment is there's quite heavy resistance at that point. Um, so you do really need to look at this stock as not necessarily a buy and hold stock, but a very much more a trading stock where you buy for short periods of time and then enter. And you can make some really good money if you do it. Um, as you said, you were, you were up quite well. So since that March 2020 low, it's up 140 odd percent, was up 159 percent. Let's look at a couple of other runs here. You can see from that low through there, through to roughly around there, there's up over 50 percent. So you can make some good money when it actually does run. So from yeah, November 2013 to, to April 2015, up 90%. So you can see the runs last for a couple of years, generally. Um, and that's a, you know, give it a wide berth on that one. But here's 189% between 2009 or February 2009 and February 2011. So a couple of years. And so it does run really, really well. But then you can spend big time going down where the opposite occurs for you. So obviously after that run, we're seeing a big move down 51%. Um, here's another move down looking at that one there, that one is around 50, was that 39 or 59? That's 39%. And obviously the more recent one from here down to here, you can see a big move down 63%. So you don't want to get caught in one of those, but look, look at that. It, it, this stock, after that big run up through here into June 20, uh, 2008, before as the GFC hit, big, big run up. I'm not sure we're going to see another one of those again at the moment, but you are right at the moment. You are in profit, which you mentioned. Stay with the stock. Let's have a quick look on the weekly chart. You can see a big turnaround last week. We're pushed up to that resistance level and came back. It wouldn't surprise me if this stock came down over the next few weeks. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six weeks here to that. I would expect it to come back down under that sort of 370, probably even down to that 340 maybe even 3.30 or 3.20 over the next few weeks. But if it only comes down for one or two weeks and it sort of sits around 3.50 or above, I think you might be okay and it'll push through that level. But just put a stop loss on it um, and just be careful because you want to protect the capital that you've got in there firstly. But secondly, I'm sure you want to protect the profits that you make. But right now I do like the stock. I'm not saying it's not going to go through that um, resistance level. It may very, very well do that. But you just need to make sure you've got rules around that. But just don't sell because it's hit that level what i'm saying is is just watch for the next couple of weeks see what it does 
if it sort of holds up in price reasonably well, even though it come down, it might come down a little bit, uh, and then turns, it might break through that resistance level and, and do quite well over the coming year. But uh, at this point in time, just watch it at the moment. So would I be getting into this stock right now? No, I'd be sitting back and waiting. If I'm in it right now, I'm holding. That's really my answer. Thanks for your email. Now, the next one we've got from Chris, who says, hi, Dale and the Wealth Within team. Thank you so much for your episodes. They are always thought out and use common sense. And I was looking for your opinion on Orica. I bought this stock recently at $15.81 with a stop loss at 14.55, so 14.81 and a stop loss at 14.55. Um, I bought this stock on the thought that it confirmed the new lower, sorry, new lower low and a higher high, confirming an uptrend. And I'm, am I on the right track? I think I said that right. I think the words went past me, but let's go and have a look at Orica anyway. Now, so he bought it recently. Um, so he bought it just in this sort of area here, probably around in that sort of bar, possibly around that bar there. I think it probably would have bought it there. So let me put the horizontal line roughly on around, what was about 1585, wasn't it? He bought it around um, something around there. So, and he's got a, a stop loss at around $14.90. So let's go and put, so around that. It's a very, very, very tight stop loss you've got on this this at the moment. So probably too tight for a stock like Orica. So I, I probably wouldn't agree with your stop loss. I like your entry. I think it's really, really nice. Um, look, I don't have an issue with your entry price. I don't have an issue with the stock at the moment. It's looking good. It's come off, you know, looking at this stock, you can see how um, volatile it's been and it's had a really got really really strong support around that 10 11 dollar mark so it looks like it's doing well looks like it's got plenty to move up before it gets any sort of resistance at this point in time we've got a little bit of bearishness last week after breaking through that level doesn't surprise me with this stock because it can do that we can see big moves and then come back but as long as it it might come back it might come back into that sort of 15 odd dollar mark but i think your stop loss is too tight I'd, I think I'd give it a little bit more room and I think I would do 15% of my buy price on this stock, but it does look good. Uh, stay with it. I think you're doing really, really well and I think you will do really, really well out of this stock as long as you don't get stopped out too early. That's my only concern for you at this point in time that if it does come down over the next couple of weeks to um, reset a little bit, um, it may stop you out and if you would miss out on the next run up, if you don't jump back into it again. So may just have a little bit more, not so much a tighter stop loss. And tight stop losses is one of the things that kill traders. We see so many people have tight stop losses. And the main reason they set tight stop losses is because they don't know how to exit and they fear losing their capital, fear losing their profit. Once you have solid rules and strategies around a stock, you can let a stock unfold and move up and down. And I've had stocks move up and down 15% on me before with a 15% stop loss, move through my 15%, but my trigger was to sell if it closed on any week below 15% held with the trade and then made 100% in the next few months. And it really, it, I won't say it takes guts, but it takes knowing your rules and knowing yourself. And all too often I see people uh, and traders set stop losses really, really tight because they don't trust their rules or they don't trust themselves. And if that's you, then that's, I'm not saying it's you, the person that asked this question, but I'm saying if that's you, the viewer watching it at the moment, then that tells you it's a real big song, strong sign that your rules aren't good enough or you haven't practiced enough and you haven't honed your rules. And when I'm teaching traders, I say to them, don't practice till you get it right. Practice till you can't get it wrong. And that's when you know that you know your rules will work for you most of the time and you have the confidence to run with those rules. And that's the difference between speculators and real traders, if that makes sense. And hopefully that does make sense. I'm not trying to be rude to anybody, but there are a lot of people out there that believe or they have a delusion that they are a trader, but they're really not because their rules, they don't trust their rules, they don't trust themselves, they don't have solid rules. They've played around with some rules that they've read online or they've seen on YouTube or whatever else, but they don't really understand them if that, and, and wisdom, there's an old saying that, um, Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a, a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable, but wisdom is knowing you don't put a tomato in a fruit salad. How wise are you about the market? And that's the question I need to ask, or you need to ask yourself, because wisdom only comes from having the right rules, the right strategies, and knowing, and the word is knowing, that you know them well, that you can trust them. And so to me, it's about getting that right education. And all too often I find so many people go off on tangents and have the wrong education or wrong understanding of things. But that's my little soapbox for the day. But I do like this stock. I think you're going to do well with it. 
Um, so stay with it. Now, the next question that we have is, um, it's, I don't even know who it's from. I forgot to put their name in it, so I do apologize. It'll be on the screen at the moment. Anyway, you'll be able to see who you are. He says, hi, Dale. For the past two years, I've been concentrating on building a strong portfolio on startup companies in rare earth sector. The likes of Linus, RNU, and ARU, to mention a few, and seeing huge gains. Also, taking notes of the Australian government giving conditional loans to these companies. I welcome your thoughts relating to this sector. Let's go. I'm going to have a look at Linus, but I don't. The rare earth sector, I've liked it. I like it. I'd always liked it. I've liked it for a long, long time. It is a strong sector and it will continue to be a strong sector for a while. But there's a point when things get overheated, if that makes sense. So when. So the safe time at the moment, the last safe time in those sectors has been for the last couple of years. So. Have you done well? Yes, you've done really, really well because you're making a profit. Will you continue to do well? That's the different point. And that's what I sort of was talking about a little bit earlier when I was mentioning about hydrogen stocks and, and other sort of small cap or startup stocks and startup companies. Do I agree with your portfolio construction? No, yes, you've made money, but I don't agree with the portfolio construction. Constructing a portfolio of startups is not a strong, not a wise way to start a portfolio or have a portfolio because it's going to be too hit and miss because all too often people will pick startup companies to see some of them just go sideways or, or down and, and not really do well. And also you see people buy startups and they do make some money for a while, while because they move up strongly because there's talk around them and then they start to turn around but then they don't know where to sell which is what I was talking about and then they come down and then they go sideways for ever in a day. Um, and we see that so often time and time and time and time again. So are you doing well? Yes. But again, like I was saying a little bit earlier, the measure is how much money ends up in your bank account because when your money's on the market, it's not yours. Now, whilst you might like to think it's yours, the money on your market, the money you have on the market is controlled by the market, not you. All you can control is when do you get in or do you get out? So if you've got stocks in the market, your only decision is do I stay in or get out? So... Everything else is up to the market, what it's doing. It will control whatever the price is on any day or any second of that day. So you need to make sure that you're onto it and understanding how to manage your positions so that you do protect your capital first and foremost, and secondly, protect that profit that you make. But let's go and have a quick look at Linus anyway, because that's one of the stocks you mentioned. Um, I'll bring it up on the screen so you can have a bit of a look at it. I do like Linus. It's looking really, really nice. Beautiful trending stock and has been for the last couple of years, and I'm going to bring it up here. But have a look at this. It's took off like a rocket. And this is sort of what I was talking about. People getting into rare earth, 2011, beautiful. And then all of a sudden, people are held all the way down, would have come back down into a loss situation. And, and you might say to me, well, people would have sold. No, there would have been a lot of people held all the way up and all the way down. And then all this way over near, and we've, from that low there in 2015 to 2017, really not making any money, not much through here. Even here, that low there at $1 and two, that one's 51 cents through there. So you would have doubled your money from that point there to that point there, but gone through a lot of periods of up and down. If you'd bought in there, you would be losing money. So that's what I'm saying is this is a beautiful run. And the more volume that comes into this, the more steady uh, it will be. And you can see here, it's a lot more volume coming in here than through here. So the more volume into the stock, the more steady the trends you are likely to find. It's not a guaranteed, but generally that means more mainstream people are getting into it or the big money's getting into it and people are supporting that in a better way. So you're going to get a much more consistent trend out of it and much more predictability, which is the critical thing. And that's why Janine and I constantly say don't buy speculative stocks or you know those mining or low cap stocks simply because your predictability or percentage chance of making money out of it is quite low. Now, I'm not saying you've done the wrong thing here. I'm just saying right now is this stock is looking really, really good. I do like it. I do like this space, but you know, but also I do like that hydrogen space. And that's where lithium was several, several years ago, but it's becoming a lot more mainstream. So you're going to see more investment into it. Um, over the coming years and, and a lot more of those stocks looking mainstream, especially when you've got stocks like Fortescue, West Farmers um, and the energy companies like Origin and Engine, everything looking at that and AGL into that space, you know that they're keen for that um, because obviously that will help them because from what I was reading about hydrogen is you can pipe it through the gas pipes, you can um, transport as liquid or a gas. So it really will fit into 
can, uh, our current infrastructure, if that makes sense. So even that Wes Farmer subsidiary is looking at um, setting up um, refueling stations for vehicles that run on hydrogen. So it's a pretty exciting space. But anyway, that could be the next big thing for you to look at. Anyway, but thank you very much for sending in your email. And thanks to everyone for sending in your questions. And remember, to get the best chance to have your questions or your emails answered is to publicly subscribe to our channel and then type your question below in the comments sector. Uh, remember that here on this channel, we do these Monday market reports each and every week. We also do our live stream every Tuesday night between 7 and 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Time, so I look forward to seeing you there. Hit the subscribe button now, click the bell on the right of it so you know when we upload and go live. Give us a huge big thumbs up as well. We love to see the thumbs up to say that's you've done a great recording and, and thanks to the team. Also, if you're listening to this soundtrack via a podcast, remember to give us a big five-star rating on your preferred pl podcasting platform and give us a review. That's it for me. I'm Dale Gillen, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within. Goodbye, good luck and good trading.